Hi, I want to welcome you here to Palm Sunday Worship. I know we can't be together physically for this, but it's important that we still worship together on this day. This day is an incredibly important day for us. It marks the beginning of Holy Week, the pinnacle of the Christian year. We celebrate this day, Jesus re-entering Jerusalem, entering as king with the Festival of the Palms. As we go forward in this week, we're going to celebrate and remember Monday, Thursday, where Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples. Friday, we remember Good Friday when Jesus was crucified. Then, of course, next Sunday is Easter. And I am so glad you are here to worship with us. My name is Mike. I'm the pastor here at Shepherd of the Hills. We have a beautiful worship service in store for you. We're going to have some wonderful music, and we're going to explore what this story means for us today. I am so glad you're here. Let's pray. Lord, fill this time with your spirit, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth wherever we are physically, that we might worship you with all that we have and all that we are. Amen.
está, la tierra le está. this one out for you. This is a tough Sunday. I don't know about y'all, but I'm having a really weird time of it. And part of it is I am so used to Palm Sunday being this big festival Sunday. I'm so used to this, this time where we have people process in with palms, where People shout Hosanna where we sing this big musical celebration. And to have this time where we can't be together physically, I'm really kind of conflicted about it. And part of it for me is just the life that I live and everything else. I'm always used to these big, long discussions about, okay, how are we going to do Palm Sunday this year? What are we going to do with the palms? Are we going to have the children's choir sings? Are we going to do all these other things? And so I have a lot of my life and my professional right, life wrapped up in Palm Sunday. But that's not a bad thing. It's an important day. It's an important time. And I think that conflict that I'm living with I know a lot of us are living with, helps us understand better what happened 2,000 years ago. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. And I know if you're new to the story, if you're new to Christianity, if you're just trying to figure out who this Jesus is and what this Bible story is, you're like, okay, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, yeah, what do I do with that? It's a good question. See, here's the tradition. When a king entered the city, if he was riding on a war horse, it was a sign he was a conquering hero, and he was slaying all his enemies before him. 
But when a king with all his triumphal procession comes in to Jerusalem, comes into the city riding a donkey, it's a sign of peace. See, Jesus had spent three years traveling the length and breadth of Israel, teaching and preaching and doing miracles and healings and raising people from the dead. And now he comes down from the Mount of Olives and he starts to ride up to Jerusalem on a donkey. And everybody's waving palm branches and they're laying garments down on the road in front of him and they're greeting him as king. And they're yell, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of David. Blessed is the Son of the Most High. All these things, hailing him as king. But the thing is, what they're expecting and what Jesus delivers are two very different things. You see, when all these people saw Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday, they were expecting him to throw out the Romans, to cleanse the temple, to restore everything the way it was supposed to be, to put it all back together. And I mean, they're dealing with this stuff. They are dealing with this life where they cannot be the people that they want to be, the people that they feel called to be. Think about it. The Romans had said to the Jewish people, you still want to worship in the temple? That's fine. You can still worship in the temple. But we are going to put a big stinking guard tower looking down at the temple where we are going to fill it with unclean Gentile soldiers who will destroy any uprising. So you'd go to the temple and you'd worship and you'd make your sacrifices and you would say your prayers and you would do all the things that you wanted to do and then you'd lift your eyes up to the heavens and see the Romans. Kind of like, I don't know, wanting to go to Palm Sunday worship and at the same time not being able to sing with other people, not being able to stand close to other Christians, it's kind of rough, isn't it? And I mean, that's kind of why I'm feeling conflicted today. But I think, I think this helps us understand what's going on better. Not that I wish this on us, not that I wish this on anybody, but this tension that we're dealing with is the tension inherent in the story. We're dealing with this time where death and sickness divide us physically. 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people, they expected one kind of a savior, a savior who would kick out the Romans and restore the monarchy and do all these things. They got a savior who died for their sins and restored their relationships with God the Father. They got something greater. They got something bigger. Friends, I know, I know that we are here and we really want to be together. I know that we are looking forward to that day when we can get past this affliction, past this plague, But there's something even greater for us. In my message from Wednesday, I mentioned that Mark spends half the book laying out this case for who Jesus is. And then he asks this question, who do you say that I am? And this story of Palm Sunday so wraps this up. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he just the guy who fixes the things that needed to be fixed? Does the little stuff that we want, that we only cry out to when we're really in trouble? Or is he the guy 
that is really our Lord and our Savior. The one we would follow even to death. You see, I was just talking to the confirmation kids the other day. And we were talking about just all the stresses and dislocations that we're dealing with right now. Because we're all dealing with new lives, new things, and new challenges. I mean, those 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, in the space of, what, 96 hours, they went from you wake up going to school, and then you find out the governor's closing school on Monday, and boom, you're getting homeschooled. I mean, that is a whole new routine. That is a whole new life. And it's a new challenge for everybody. And the thing that we need to remember is as much as we want Jesus to fix the little things in our lives, the questions of what are we going to do next week, the questions of when are we going to be able to go back to school, go back to normal job, be able to go to Culver's and have a nice hot foot Sunday. The thing is, Jesus is bigger than all that. He is bigger than death itself. It is so easy to go from Palm Sunday straight to Easter and miss the intervening portions. To miss the meal that, celebrate, that Jesus celebrates with his disciples. The Passover meal, the meal that becomes for us communion, which we call the Lord's Supper. To miss Good Friday, where Jesus dies on the cross for us. What I want you to do my hope, my prayer for you in this strange season we're having, in this Monday, Thursday, Good Friday that seems to last for months at a time. I want you to pause and reflect and understand whatever it is that you're going through right now, whatever the issues are that you're dealing with, right now, that Jesus is Lord of those things, of the chaos, of the uncertainty, Lord who is bigger than death itself. We are going to walk through this time together. Even if we cannot meet physically, we will be together in spirit and in truth. And so I want you to celebrate this day that Jesus, as he rode into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, was king of that city. And he is still our king. And we still follow him, even though it seems dark today. The sun will come up and Jesus will be glorified. Friends, that is our hope. That is our prayer. That is our assurance in these days. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for your assurance in these difficult times. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to know you, to follow you. And we pray that you would be glorified in every part of our life. Amen.
Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your Spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives praise him as Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And so together we pray for all those in need, for all those we lift up now in our hearts, for all those battling illness and sickness and job loss and uncertainty. Lord, we pray that you would pour your spirit into them, put them in the right places to be blessed and to be a blessing. We pray that you would give us all your grace. Help us to know you and to follow you closely. Lord, we pray for all those we now lift up silently or with our, with our words. And so together we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Now, as we always say here at Shepherd of the Hills, our worship does not end, but it does change form. And so as you go into this world to take this blessing with you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.